Welcome to All in a Weekend. Great to be here, Sonelli. Now, what is a tipsy quest? <laughs> well, I'm very thorough with my research. <laughs> Let's just say I sample a lot and broadly. Um, I guess that subtitle is there to signal quite strongly that this is not a serious or, I hope, boring wine tome. It's about having fun with wine because, you know, that's my approach. Wine is social. It's alcoholic grape juice. And yet, you know, it's there for you if you want to dive into it deeper, if you want to get to know the regions and the history and the culture and so on. But it's also there just to enjoy. Now, you say that people often ask you for a wine that costs less than five bucks for a recommendation for like a a five dollar wine. (laughs) What do you tell them? No, not unless all you want is a wet tongue. (laughs) (laughs) There is a limit. Even I, as a wine cheapskate, have a limit. Um, There are certain cost factors that go into making wine. And so when you get that low, you really are looking at sort of a mass produced product that's like breakfast cereal. But I think people would be surprised at how little you can pay to get a really good bottle in that, you know, 10 to $15 range. Well, I'm going to ask you about that. So what is your definition of a real bargain wine? I define it as uh, price against quality or taste. And so in that 10 to $15 range these days, I think you can get a lot of wines that taste twice as expensive as they cost. So a bottle that, or a wine that will taste like a $25 wine. And the reason is that winemakers have improved their game. They know much better around the world which grapes work and how to optimize that. Technology has brought costs down and competition, new regions like Argentina and others are coming into the stores. Really, it's, it's never been a better time to be a wine shopper. But, you know, $10 to $15 is your definition of bargain. Any lower? I'm just, I, I, I want to push it a little bit. Sure. Any lower? Yes. Um, I, I guess the majority of what I find um, in terms of bargain wines are in that range. But I have recommended wines that are $7, $8, $9. They're, they're few and far between, but, uh, you know, they're out there. And, and they can, you know, be just as tasty. And I, I think people's expectations are probably lower as well. If you're paying $7 for a bottle of wine, you're like, meh. Yeah. It's uh, wine. Yeah, come on. It's not uh, whatever. <laughs> Shadow Latour. Let's, you're not going to sit there sniffing and analyze it. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. And, th- and, th- and that's okay. It's okay because it's wine is what you want it to be. It, you know, it's a, just a social beverage to be enjoyed with people, preferably, I think, with food. And, you know, not all of us want to sit there and analyze it with all the, you know, fruit salad description of aromas. <laughs> <laughs> but why would you choose to write a book on bargain wine? Because I think um, I want to connect with as many people as possible. Like, wine is really an excuse for me to be nosy and to get into people's lives. So I visited (laughs) winemakers around the world, and they allowed me to sit in their kitchens and at their dining room tables and and share stories. And so what this is a search for the world's best bargain wines, but it's also a search for the most interesting people in the wine industry. I was looking for great people to profile. And so when you talk bargain wines, I think you can connect with far more people, both on the research side with the winemakers, but also on the reader's side. Because, you know, we all, we're not open, we're not cracking open Chateau Margot each night. This book is also a travel memoir as well. You, just to give us a taste of your style, could you read something from the book? Oh, absolutely. Let's go to South Africa. Um, I met, uh, well, they're all interesting, but this, this winemaker, Charles Back, he uh, you may be familiar with some of his wines, Goats du Rome, which is a takeoff on Cote <laughs> de Rhone, yes, the French labels. He, he has fun. And so um, this is him talking. Now, for some reason, the French get all twitchy when they see their place names on other wine labels, Charles says, as we walk through a busy tasting room lit by twinkling lights on goat horn chandeliers. Drinkers cluster around three tasting bars, and the room is abuzz with French, German, Dutch, Japanese, and other languages. I love the spittoons, gray milking pails. Charles' puns are a cheeky riposte to stiff French tradition. There's goat door, so the coat door, a blend uh, or a Chardonnay wink at Burgundy's coat door, the goat father, a blend of Italian Barbera and Sangiovese, <laughs> and my favorite label is a Cabernet blend. It has a rather blasé a female goat in front of a French chateau, and the name is Bordeaux. And he says the wines originally took off before the critter label craze, because even though we weren't part of that, he recalls, the 
uh, the, the wines really, um, you know, he, I loved what he said. He said the first sale is based on the label and maybe a playfulness with the names. The second sale is based on what was in the first bottle, the quality. So when we talk bark and wines, we're still talking about good quality. Um, where else on your travels do you find the best cheap wines? Well, you know, if you look at um, warm climates like Argentina and Chile, um, they because they have a warm climate, they're not fighting um, as much uh, disease and mold and mildew and bad harvests. So the cost of production is lower, naturally lower. And that's why we get those ripe, fleshy Malbecs, those big red wines from Argentina or the Cabernets from Chile. So that that's definitely uh, regions to look for warm climates. Another one might be like Germany or Portugal, uh, countries that were traditional but are trying to revitalize their image because they may have had a bit of a sorry reputation in the past and now they really need to get competitive. The quality has come up, but they're still fighting those old perceptions. But I think with, with especially with white wines, there's a tendency when they're cheaper to be sweeter and then you get to this point where it's just, you feel like you're drinking, you know, tang yeah. after a while, you <laughs> yeah. know? That's right. And with Germany, that's what they're battling. Everybody thinks it's, you know, syrupy sweet. It's the stuff that some of us tried in the 70s and 80s, and it was uh, shadow plonk. But these days, um, German Rieslings, Rosé is another one. They can they are made bone dry and, and very well. Um, so it, it's, it's worth revisiting those wines that may still have a hangover in your mind because they've really come a long way, but they're still incredible bargains. And what about Quebec? Quebec. Um, the Eastern Townships, of course, has a very vibrant winemaking um, community. Some of my favorite wines from Quebec are the crisp, dry white wines, but also um, I think what stands out for me are the ice ciders and ice wines. Mm -hmm. And Canada is known across the country for our ice wines. It's it's what put us on the viticultural map. Um, it's because it's a product of having a cool climate, but they're they're terrific. And you know, I think other countries probably have a longer history of producing cheaper wines. So where is Canada in terms of sort of being at the same level as, say, France or Spain or uh, South Africa even, and being able to produce the variety of, of wines that are would be considered bargain wines and quality. Right. That That's a good question, because if we look at, say, Niagara, for instance, they produce wonderful Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is not a cheap grape to uh, produce, to grow, to make. Why is that? It's because they call it the heartbreak grape. It's finicky. It um, will. It's very susceptible to disease and rot, but it loves a cool climate because it has this nervy energy. It's It's got the fleshy fruit, but it's balanced with the acidity, and that only happens in a cool climate. So the the trade-off is that um, you will have a bad harvest every once in a while, um, you'll lose part of your crop, uh, but when you make it and it works, it's sublime. So if you look at Niagara Pinot Noirs, they don't start much lower than $15, $20, and then they go up. But if you compare that to Benchmark Burgundy, the heart of Pinot Noir, th those are going to start at at least 40 or $50. So again, uh, bargain and value is relative. For what's in the bottle and the quality of Niagara Pinot Noir, they still, they are bargains. Okay. Uh, now, when you go to the liquor store, though, how can we choose a good expensive wine? What are you looking for? A good expensive wine. A good inexpensive oh, wine. Oh, inexpensive wine. Oh, my okay, goodness. yes. Good expensive wine. Look at the price tag. But a good inexpensive... <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, when you're looking for an inexpensive wine, right. what are some of the things you want to look for? Well, you know, um, at the end of each chapter in this book, I have insider tips from each chapter. And so I think one of the things to do is to start with some of the regions that are offering good value. So go to those areas in the liquor store. They're usually in the sections. So you might start with Argentina or Chile or Sicily. Um, like Sicily hmm. is a wonderful region because it's Tuscany and Piedmont that are very expensive, and Sicily is very little known. And yet it's got some wonderful Italian wines from that region. So you want to start with a good region. You want to start with what they specialize in. So for Argentina, it's Malbec. It's not a fashionable grape like Cabernet. So again, you're going to pay less. And then from there, uh, you're looking for maybe a handful of uh, reputable producers. If you want to have a shopping list, um, that always helps. I I, every week on, on my website at nataliemcclain.com, I post my favorites. So if you have like maybe three or four in mind, like say Argentina Malbec, Catina is a good one, Alamos, and just, um, you know, it's a way to start and start sampling. Now you talk about some of the colorful characters from your wine world tour. Shall yes. we say? Yes. Um, there's a really funny part about Wolf Blast. Now, first of all, is he actually a real person? 
great question because everybody thinks he's a brand character like Duncan Hines or Betty Crocker, but he's actually real, just like Calvin <laughs> Klein, Ralph Lauren. Um, but I don't think a, a marketing team could ever invent a man so colorful. Um, so when I met him at the winery, he was just barreling toward me um, over the winery lawn, uh, trailed by a you know an entourage of paid optimists, <laughs> Wor- worried, very worried PR people, and you know he's well into his seventies, but he's got the energy of a man you know half his age and twice his height. He's five foot three, and so he's just so. But he realizes that. Um, Really, behind every bottle of wine is a person and a story, and he's always made himself part of that story in a very colorful way. So, for example, at baseball games, he would go talk to the um, the cameraman before the game, and he would say, I'm going to be in the crowd with my winery sign, and every time you focus on my sign, there's a case of wine in the trunk for you after the game. <laughs> <laughs> and so he says, uh, oh, and, and then there's, there's the, the ball is hit out of the park. It's a home run. The ball is up, up, up. And everybody's watching it except the cameraman. You know, he's found my sign. Bloody cunning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, he just he loves those kind of things. And then at airports, he would have himself, himself paged over the intercom system so that shoppers at duty-free stores would hear the name Wolf Blass. He was, he was a real genius. That's hysterical. Yeah, he is hysterical. But how is Wolf Blass for bargain wines? Terrific, because he makes a line of wines. I mean, he, he's not actually the winemaker anymore, but... Um, what happens with Wolf Blass and other, uh, a lot of other Australian brands actually, like Penfolds, is they will have an entry level that starts at twelve to fourteen dollars, very reasonable, and then they'll go up to well over a hundred bucks. And I think of it as um, kind of like a, a second label, like there's Max Mara and Max Mara Weekend Wear. So what you're getting is the expertise of a great winemaking um, winemaker, winemaker f- making facility. You you get the good barrels and everything else. But they're, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, here are the best grapes. They're going into the $100 bottle. Here are the next and next best and next best. It doesn't mean you get the schlock at the end of the line. It just means that they have the capacity to create a whole range of price points, and it really is a bargain at their entry point. What surprised you the most about drinking your way around the world for this book, other than some of the unbelievable characters you met along the way? Oh, well, I I guess I'm surprised at just how much wine can be an entry point into a culture, um, people's lives. I always say you could do a, a liberal arts degree with wine as the organizing hub, because it connects to, if you think, uh, history, trade, commerce, science, agriculture, um, religion, art. There's just so much that ties it together. But um, at the same time, there's nothing, I think, that brings us together around the table in a communal sense than sharing a good meal. And wine, to me, is an integral part of a good meal. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Sonelli. Cheers.